Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal, as usual, how the world really works. And one way the world really works is that change is a constant. That's how we know we're alive. Change is around us all the time. And we always know that the more that things change, the more we need to depend on those things that never change. And one of the things that never changes is the nature of the happy warrior. And so not only do I welcome each and every one of you happy warriors to today's Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, but I also take the opportunity of reminding you that happy warriors form friendships and nurture them. We check to see that our friendships are in good shape. We try and grow them in number and in quality. We take friendships seriously. Happy warriors do not ever dismiss the importance of finance by telling themselves, oh, not everything is about money. Of course not everything is about money. But I can assure you that much more is than you suspect. And so happy warriors do not dismiss the importance of finance. Happy warriors, well, you're devoted to your family, (laughs) even if there are times that some of them infuriate you. Happy warriors, you don't neglect caring for your body. You, You do care for it. You avoid indulgence. You choose challenge. You try to make yourself more in touch with faith today than you were yesterday. Yeah, that's another characteristic of a happy warrior. And above all, as a happy warrior, you are not clinging to a rung on the ladder or holding desperately onto a ledge on the mountainside. You are constantly climbing upwards, never in the same place tomorrow as you were today. The credo of the happy warrior is onwards and upwards. Happy warriors are active, never passive. We never say things like, oh, a decision will have to be reached. We proclaim, I will make a decision by 11 o'clock. Happy warriors are not tennis balls floating down the gutter of life. Oh, no. Last week, in the last week's show, it was entitled, Some Men Talk and Feel, Others Decide and Act, Which Is Better? And during the course of that show, I had occasion to discuss the subject of therapy. And uh, I just want to clarify that I am very well aware of situations that people have been in in which therapy has helped. And um, I want to avoid anybody feeling, because I did hear from a number of people who felt that I was dismissing therapy in its entirety, that there is no value to it at all. And I would never say that. But... um, I would say that when people ask my advice on therapy, I always tell them that there are five uh, requirements, uh, excuse me, four requirements that I always uh, always put in as a proviso for therapy. Number one, I recommend that you select a therapist who is God-centric and Bible-conscious. Okay, why is that? Because even if you're not, that is so much a part of reality and so much a part of what motivates us 
is spiritual rather than material. And so much of what ails us is a God vacuum, which gets transliterated into all kinds of mental maladies. But a therapist who is God-centric and Bible-conscious is going to be much more in touch with the totality of your mental and spiritual experience. You'll get more for your money. Number two is that therapy should never be open-ended, allowing it to go on for year after year after year. And I, I mentioned that last time. Because whatever can be achieved can be accomplished in far less time. That's not to say you may not need to go back to your therapist uh, a year or two later for another few sessions. It's very possible. But uh, uh, there are people who've been in therapy for nine years. When I say there are people, and I say specifically nine years, because I'm thinking of somebody in particular whom I know. That is not any good. This person never asked my opinion, so I never said anything. Um, number uh, number three in the, uh, the the things that I personally tend to be conscious of and recommend people to be aware of when choosing a therapist. Um, I recommend that you select a therapist who is not a heavily committed Freudian. I would much rather work with a Jungian therapist than a Freudian therapist. And that one is quite important. Uh, they all are. And then finally, number four, this would seem to be self-evident, but it isn't. And what's more, I get pushback on this. I, I fully expect to receive emails uh, from listeners objecting specifically to this one. But nonetheless, uh, I express it forcefully, deliberately, and with great assurance that it is an important and a true one. And that is that you need a male therapist for a male patient and a woman therapist for a female patient. And, and in all cases, there is great value in having a therapist who is happily married. I strongly recommend against working with a single therapist. Now, again, I, I realize I'm going to get pushback on that, but that doesn't worry me. It's quite okay. Uh, what some people will say is, do you do that with your plumber? Is it important that your plumber is uh, is married? Is it important to you that your uh, car mechanic is married? Is it a, important that your drywall installer is married? No, but it is important to me that my therapist is married. Um, I'm not going to take the time to go into why this is so important now, but if this is something that bothers a lot of people, well, I'll know about it. You can be sure of that. And then I will uh, devote some time to it um, because it, it will mean there are people who find that confusing and do not understand why it's necessary. You know, once upon a time, you know, you might wonder, like, where are all the therapists in Charles Dickens novels? Uh, where are all the therapists' advertisements in 1800s novels? Uh, directories and the answer is that uh, therapy is a far more modern phenomenon uh, therapy the equivalent of therapy what therapy provides used to be provided by a man's friends mentors and religious and religious leaders these days you know many of us guys we're not really good at talking not with our friends not with our religious leaders. So a good therapist, noting my uh, uh, five requirements, I said four, but if, if I'd say it as, as a list of five, one, the practitioner is God-centric and Bible conscience, conscious. Number two, that uh, the therapy is never open-ended, that can go on for year after year. Uh, number three, that the practitioner tends more towards Jungian than Freudian, if either. Neither is also okay, but not fully Freudian. Number four uh, is a man for a male patient and a woman for a female patient. And number five, happily married. The therapist is happily married. And so 
uh, today, a good therapist fills a need for some people, right? Or at certain times. The danger is, as in most things, it's a question of excess. Too much therapy can emasculate a man. And that's what I was talking about in last week's show. Too much talking makes a man less decisive and less action-oriented, which means to deprive him of the essence of masculinity. Furthermore, some therapists, and, and this is just a really, really big danger, uh, some therapists just get off on building patient dependency. Yes, it's a true and terrible danger. There are therapists who find deep emotional gratification from becoming another person's master, advisor, decision maker in all things big and small. Needless to say, it's awful for a man, awful for a man to hand over decision making to a therapist. By the way, there's some rabbis and priests and and clergymen who tend to do the same thing as well, who take away decision making from the person who is consulting with them, right? And that's very much against an ancient Jewish wisdom approach, which is to uh, never take over the decision-making process, that, the, uh, that the, the person who is consulting you is encouraged to make the decision, is helped to make a decision, but what decision the person makes has to be the, the person's decision themselves. And I want to um, uh, tell you about membership in the Happy Warriors community. Uh, I would recommend that you take a look at it because we all need connection. Um, I, I spoke about something several times over the last year or so uh, in that our identity is very much shaped by the company we keep. What I mean to say by that is that uh, the notion of knowing who you are when you are utterly isolated from people makes no sense. It follows from there, conversely, that the clearer your identity is, the more connected you are with community. Family, friends, obviously at the the innermost level, family and friends, but, uh, but then there's community beyond that. Uh, the people one works with, the people one does business with, uh, there are people who may be part of your faith family. Um, you know, you might belong to a model train society, and <laughs> and there are people who do who find great joy in being part of that kind of hobbyists community, and so we happy warriors, all of us, we who are trying to make sure that uh, we are not tennis balls floating down the gutter of life and that we are all struggling to move onwards and upwards, particularly in the five critical areas of a fulfilling life, our friendships, our finances, our families, our faith and our fitness. It's very helpful to be able to collaborate with other people. It's one of the reasons that the Alcoholics Anonymous organization, doing such great work for a long time already in helping people overcome alcohol addiction, the community is very much a part of it. It's not a case of buying a leaflet or a brochure or a book or watching a video. No, you have to be at your meetings because community is such a very important part of it. And so, so it is, the We Happy Warriors, uh, we have a community as well. You, you'll find it at wehappywarriors.com. That's the website, wehappywarriors.com. You've got conversation with other people. That's of crucial value. Um, you can get audios, many, many audios, uh, particularly of our weekly postings, things that make it easy to listen while you're driving somewhere, listen while you're exercising, uh, even listening while you're going to sleep at night. Um, Here's a tip for you. Don't go to sleep watching a video. Don't go to sleep watching a movie. 
Don't go to sleep watching television. Rather go to sleep listening to something. You will sleep better and you will get benefit from that time as you are fading into the arms of Morpheus. And so you listen to audio. It's a wonderful idea. And all of that at wehappywarriors.com. So join me and all the other happy warriors as part of our community where we encourage and strengthen one another, we answer one another's questions, and we help make sure that all of us are moving onwards and upwards. Got to tell you also about um, the full meaning of what a battery is. And think about it. You know, you uh, uh, you you have a uh, a phone or you have a tape recorder or whatever it is you have, and it's running low. So one of the things, if some devices, you just walk into the nearest drugstore and you buy yourself two AAA batteries and pop them into your device. And away you go. Or you might have a device with a built-in lithium-ion battery, like your uh, smartphone perhaps, or your pad, iPad, or your uh, um, tablet device. And then you have to replenish the battery. And so you plug it in, and after two hours, it's replenished, it's full. Let me give you a couple of other examples of the battery concept a full water tower. You know, in in some towns in America, uh, there's a big bulbous shaped metal tank, perhaps 100 feet up in the air on tall steel legs. Sometimes it's on a sort of a pedestal. Uh, That's a water tower. And that is to stabilize the water pressure for all the people in that community. And so when that water tower is full, it's, it's kind of like a battery because you can now open a faucet down below and the water just magically flows. It's, it's so amazing that if you show that to a recent immigrant from out of Mongolia, he'll want to buy that faucet to take back with him to his relatives back in the Mongolian village because he's never seen a thing like that. How extraordinary a faucet that as soon as you rotate it, out flows water. It's incredible. But that only happens because it's hooked up to the battery of the full water tower. Uh, How about a car with a full gas tank? That's also like a battery. Or a Tesla car with a full, fully charged battery, same thing. Whether it's a tank of gasoline or a fully charged battery, in both cases, the energy that has been packed into that device now allows it to function. So that's what uh, what a battery is. It's where energy in some form or another has been pre-packed into something, probably not by you, probably by other people, and you get to enjoy the benefit of it, whatever it is. That's really what a battery is. Why am I telling you about this? Well, because um, it's like having, here's another battery, a healthy bank account. In this case, you probably filled it. But that healthy bank account is a source of energy for you. That's, it's a battery. It's really what it is. I'll give you another example. You know what else it is? A reputation. Takes a long time to fill the battery of your reputation. But having a reputation is like having a charged battery because now there will be people who will seek you out in order to purchase from you whatever it is you are selling because your reputation takes a, takes a long time to build a reputation. Sadly, it takes no time at all to destroy one. A wide circle of friends, that's also a battery. A family is a battery. One of the things that happened during two years of COVID is that many people neglected family, many people neglected friendship, and uh, the trouble is that when you need a battery, now isn't the time to start trying to replenish it and fill it. 
when you need a battery, you want it already filled. And that's one of the reasons that um, people uh, sometimes keep small portable lithium-ion batteries with them so that if their phone does go dead, all they do is connect it to that and they don't have to sit and keep their phone plugged into an outlet for an hour while it's charging up. There it is. They've got it with them. See, that's the thing about a battery. When you've run out of gas in your car, you don't now want to say to yourself, well, I guess I better fill it up because it's going to mean a long hike to the filling station. The thing about a battery is you kind of want it full when you need it. And so it takes a time. You build a family. It takes time. You build a circle of friends. It takes time. It builds a reputation. It takes time. And when one neglects those things, either as we've seen many people do during COVID, or sometimes other people literally come out of high school, literally not understanding anything whatsoever about how important it is to have a reputation and a circle of friends and a family. People don't get that. It's important. Because when you need it, it's too late to start trying to fill your battery. Having a charged battery is really useful. And I know many, many people who derive real emotional joy from seeing that their battery has, you know, plenty charged, that their battery is 80% charged, 90% charged, and they start getting filled with anxiety when it drops to 20% and it's only the middle of the afternoon. I I get that because there is joy in having fully charged batteries. There are a lot of people who don't like letting their car gas tank go down to an eighth of the tank. They like having the, the tank, you know, closer to the full end. So they'll fill it up long before it gets close to the bottom. There's a certain joy in having a full battery. And that's not just on your tablet or your iPhone, but it's not just in your car, but it's also the bank account, the reputation, friendships, family, basically a community of people with whom you are closely connected. There's another really interesting example of a battery, and that is a a round in a firearm. You think about that. If you know, I, I don't know if you've if you're somebody who knows much about firearms or not, and I do know that as part of the left-leaning campaign to discourage ownership of firearms, I know that there is a tendency to make people embarrassed about owning firearms, to make people embarrassed about even knowing anything about them. And so, uh, uh, whereas there are people who would be very comfortable uh, having a workshop of tools, and there be people very comfortable with having a lawnmower, when it comes to having a weapon, there is a feeling of, oh, I never want to have anything like that in my house. In other words, it has been tainted with the morality of evil. When in reality, it's just a tool. Now, you might say it's a tool for shooting people, but that doesn't really capture the real purpose because the question is, What sort of person are you and what sort of people are likely to be shot? The overwhelming majority of firearm owners in the United States of America, and I'm speaking about America because many other countries around the world have long ago uh, deprived citizens from having any firearms. But the overwhelming majority, and and please take note of what I'm about to tell you because you might be skeptical, but it really is the truth. The huge majority of firearm owners in the United States have never ever pointed it at another human being. They haven't. They take it to the range, they target practice, but they take pleasure in knowing 
they can defend themselves. So you might say, why is it that uh, the left wing in American politics in the current time at which I speak, which is early in 2022, the Biden administration pledges to end the epidemic of gun violence by removing guns from private ownership. They will do it. Okay. <laughs> What's that all about? Well, let me explain to you. The left has a deep commitment to being the primary mediator in people's lives. In other words, the left sees government as the center and be-all of everything. The left believes in a societal structure that's shaped like a bicycle wheel, or like, uh, yeah, like a bicycle wheel, uh, a hub and spokes all going out to the periphery. And so we as citizens all live on the periphery at the end of our spoke, and the other end of the spoke is anchored at the hub, which is government. So in other words, that is our link. We, each and every one of us, has a valency, if you're comfortable with the chemistry terminology, of one. In other words, each and every one of us has one link, and that link is to government. The biblical vision of society is very different. It's where each and every one of us has many, many links. We've got links to each of our family members. We've got links to all of our friends. We've got links to our workmates. We've got links to the people we worship with. We've got linkages to uh, uh, people we share common interests with. We have lots and lots and lots of linkages. We have a linkage to our doctor and another one to our dentist, etc., etc., etc. The dream vision of the left, the dream Marxist vision, the dream progressive vision is that government supplies everything. Everything. You know, what is the opposition? Why did the why was there so much governmental opposition to Uber and Lyft, ride sharing apps? Because they would rather you use public transport or else use a taxi which is heavily regulated by government. But to have people with their ability to travel independently deep down, that offends the sensibility of the secular fundamentalist. The uh, idea of restricting uh, traffic and uh, making parts of the city accessible only to public transport. All of these things are designed to get people out of their cars, HOV lanes on the freeway, out of the cars and into public transport because secular fundamentalism wants to see government as the primary supplier of everything you need. Why is it that the percentage of the American population that works for government, that gets its primary paycheck from government, has been going up and up and up since the, in, in the last 60 years. The change has been stupendous, where today more than half Americans get a check from government in one way or another. Very, very important. That tells you something. It's, there's a direction and it is not an accident. Why is it that secular fundamentalism is trying to move people to a single-payer health care system? Right? What did the Obamacare program move America closer towards? The idea that government becomes the supplier of medicine, just like Canada, just like the national health system in the United Kingdom. We love that. All of this is to make people less independent and more dependent on government. Now, if you think that I'm being fanciful, and it can't really be like this, well, let me go a little further. Maybe this will help. Government does everything it can to undermine private ownership of money. That's right. 
um, recently uh, in an interview with uh, what's what's that man's Tahisi Coates or Naisi Coates, I don't remember, but uh, AOC, uh, an American congresswoman, um, said nobody makes a billion dollars, they take it. Right? She, she really does believe that, as do many leftist or many progressive politicians. Uh, the President Obama he, himself said, you know, you didn't make that because they really do believe that everything does and should flow from government. And so high taxation, in order to take care of those in our society who need it and have less, this is compassion. The war against poverty, taking care of children, all of these things are designed to make you less independent and to make you needing more and more from government. More and more. Why does the level of taxation keep going up? Right? It, it is very rare, it's highly unusual when government says, you know what, I think Americans or anybody of any country, you citizens, you're being taxed too much. We want you to start keeping more of your own money. No, government will take care of it. There is a deep desire to make you turn primarily to government. There is a war on wealth being conducted so as that it becomes harder and harder for you to have a healthy bank account, and to be independent harder and harder and harder. There is a war against family. I've spoken about this many times. Why? Because if there is a characteristic that unifies people on welfare, it is that they are people without families. People with families tend to be self-sufficient. And so the government and all progressives drive a war against family in order to make you more independent. Excuse me, to make you more dependent, which is why I explain that if you have your finances taken care of and your family taken care of and your friendships taken care of, you don't need anything else. You don't need the government, not for anything. Oh, I don't know if Social Security will be functioning still in X number of years' time. It probably won't. So what? I've got my own finances. That's fine. But the government and the left and progressivism for the last 60 years have been trying to make it as impossible as, as, as it can for you to be independent. And finally, let's speak about firearms. Firearms make you independent. I don't have to dial 911 and wait so as that the eventually uh, police will arrive and find my lifeless body sprawled on the sidewalk. I don't need that because I have my trusty revolver. Right? That, and progressivism says no private ownership of weapons. You need safety, call the government. You need security, call the government. You frightened of a noise in the night, call the government. Don't take care of anything yourself. Oh no, don't do that. Because everything is moving towards trying to make you less independent and more dependent. And owning a firearm is a statement of independence. Right? That's what it is. Um, I might call 911 at a point, but that'll be after I've taken care of the immediate danger to myself or my family or my property. That's what will happen. And so uh, this is part of the war. War on family, because family makes you need government less. War on your wealth, because having a healthy bank account means you need government less. Um, uh, a war on your privately raising your own children and homeschooling your own children. Yes, there is a war on that too, because we want children in public school. Everything should come from government. That is the dream of Marxism and progressivism. It's the dream of the left. And so uh, I want to explain a little bit about firearms. And uh, and, and I want you to understand that 
it's important that you resist attempts to demonize you and to label you immoral because of your position on firearms, assuming for the moment that you have a position and that you do own a weapon or you plan on owning a weapon, then you do need to understand why there is an, an attempt to try and make you sound like an immoral person. Um, you see, the reason that uh, Joe Rogan was demonized was because he has a different opinion on COVID. Now, in the United States of America, we used to cherish different opinions. We used to regard with admiration somebody who bucked the trend and had his own opinion. He was, a, he was his own man. He was his own person. But today, the tool of public health has been extremely effectively wielded by progressivism. Because if you do anything that harms public health, by the way, there's a very, very dangerous term, this public health thing, you'll see because it covers so many areas that allow single-minded progressive control. Well, Joe Rogan challenged the, uh, the, the idea that vaccination is the only or the best way to treat COVID and that there are other ways and uh, various other entertainers, uh, entertainers have tried to make Spotify fire Joe Rogan because he's so evil. It's not that he has a different opinion. It's that he has an evil opinion. He's threatening public health. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It is really not that far different from what... Uh, anti-Semites used to do in medieval times, they said Jews were poisoning the well in the town and they're threatening public health. So obviously everybody went out and uh, killed him a Jew, right? Clear, because public health is a very emotional topic. You know, I'm sure you've been yelled at by somebody about a mosque. I know I have, because people get emotional about it. public health. And so Joe Rogan is an evil guy. Well, guess what? They now speak of um, gunfire as a public health issue. So if you are in favor of private ownership of weapons, which is in America called the Second Amendment, then you are an evil person because you are threatening public health. The reality, of course, is that there is a, the difference is not whether people have revolvers or automatics or they have AR-15s or uh, Ruger Mini-14. No, the difference are the people. There are some people who use guns for gang warfare, and there are others who use it for target shooting and for self-defense, right? It's different people. But what is intolerable in America at the moment is the notion that there are different values, that different people have different value systems. That is unacceptable. And since we can't go there, we therefore have to assume that you know why people die from gunshot fire in Chicago, for instance. It's because they're guns. That's all. It's not because there are people with bad values who go out shooting other people. <laughs> no, it's because of guns. And therefore, anybody owns a gun. Well, that's very bad. And so to mark their virtue... And this is really quite extraordinary, I have to tell you. You see, it's not a case of different opinions anymore. It's a case of evil and good, right? Some people like having guns. Some people don't know. Now, guns are evil. You see how far this is from a Judeo-Christian, biblical-centric view? In a Judeo-Christian, biblical-centric view... Inanimate objects cannot be evil. A dollar bill isn't evil. A gun is not evil. People who use guns to kill other people, innocent people, that's evil. those are evil people. Not evil guns, evil people. And people who use guns to defend their family and themselves from bad people, well, those are good. But now... 
Instead of there being a legitimate debate, it has been turned into a morality play. And that becomes very important. And this is why it is that you've got to understand that when a society abandons a Judeo-Christian Bible-based system, they don't end up with a sort of benign, neutral, religion-free public space. No! They adopt another religion. And that is the religion of secular fundamentalism, which has its own doctrines and its own theology and its own saints and its own sinners. And yes, it's morality. And so, for instance, now in order to mark their virtue, um, there are all kinds of stores. And again, if you're outside the United States, you won't know these stores possibly, or at least all of them. But Dick's Sporting Goods always used to sell guns. But now, to show that they're in favor of public health, Dick's Sporting Goods no longer selling certain types of guns. Walmart, actually the nation's largest gun seller, is now placing restrictions on gun sales. L.L. Bean, Kroger, REI, the sports organization, not going to sell guns at all. How about this? Do you know that Citibank is now going to uh, impose restrictions on anyone in gun, uh, any gun dealerships? Bank of America will no longer lend money to gun manufacturers. Um, BlackRock Financial, one of the most, one of the biggest investment firms ever to exist in history, uh, is now. Um, again, deciding not to invest in companies that have anything to do with firearms. Uh, PayPal has stopped the use of its service for the selling of firearms or ammunition. Um, it, it, it doesn't stop. And it's all being turned into a morality issue. Okay, when the truth is that if you know, there are two morality systems at war with one another here, a Judeo-Christian Bible-based system which says inanimate objects like guns are not evil. It's the people holding them that are either good or evil. Or a secular system, a system of secular fundamentalism and progressivism, which says, no, there is no such thing as evil people. There are only evil institutions and evil things. Capitalism, evil. Guns, evil. And you have to make up your mind, particularly if you are raising children. You've got to decide which moral system you adhere to. The idea that you're going to raise your sister, your children, oh, to be good people, just like that, without a fundamental and comprehensive moral system, I'm afraid that you can forget about. Those days are long gone. And that now you really do have to decide what it is. And so... At any rate, uh, I'm speaking earlier, I was explaining about batteries, and uh, I want to explain about the way a shell works. All right, I'm sure most of you already know and understand this, but a shell is a brass casing into which is packed a form, let's call it gunpowder. Technically, it's not gunpowder per se anymore. We have more sophisticated propellants. Uh, and then th at the top of it is a... Uh, a lead um, bullet and what happens is in the back of it is a percussion cap and the hammer in the firearm strikes the percussion cap that ignites the charge in the shell and the charge is it's 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 basically chemical energy it's a battery somebody not you somebody packed that shell full of something loaded with chemical energy that when you set it off, it results in a rapidly expanding volume of gas. And it expands so rapidly and so much that it forces the lead bullet out of the front of the brass casing with so much force that it can leave the muzzle or the barrel of the firearm at a huge speed. It, you know, it, it could be... Uh, Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles an hour. Really, right? Remarkable. I mean, it's quite possible that it leaves the barrel at five or six hundred miles an hour. Really. I mean, or more sometimes. 
So that's, that is a battery. You can think of the shell as a battery. And, and now let me just uh, explain that batteries come into being when there is a community of people sharing values and goals. In other words, if, uh, if you parachute down to a remote, isolated desert island where the uh, tribes living on the island have been out of contact with the rest of the world forever, you arrive there, when your phone goes flat, not, you know, let's assume for the moment you had a, a satellite phone, uh, let, the battery goes flat, there is no store to go into to pick up a new battery. There is no outlet to charge your battery. Uh, if you land there with a firearm and you want to protect yourself, there's no way you can buy ammunition. They don't have that. And there is no water tower. And there is no car with a full gas tank. And there is no gas station to fill up a car anyway, even if you had one. It takes a lot of time and effort, and it takes involvement with other people to build a battery, whether it's your healthy bank account, whether it's your reputation, whether it's your circle of friends, or whether it's a water tower or an electrical battery or a car with a full gas tank. It takes a community of people. Batteries you got to understand what they are. It's not just a little uh, AAA battery or a little AA battery going into your flashlight. That's one example. But the idea of a battery is one of the most remarkable underpinnings of technological development. That's something that is part of civilization. Right? Not every culture on the planet developed batteries. But Western civilization did. And for that, it should be valued and emulated. A shell, a, an, a piece of ammunition, it's a, it is a remarkable thing. Packed, you hold in your hand a little forty-four shell, and this has the power to save your life from a gang of people bent on destroying you. That's how amazing it is. And you hold this little thing in your hand, and it contains within it the chemical energy to protect you. The extraordinary thing. And, um, and so I, I would recommend that um, people to whatever extent possible uh, as long as it can be done complying with the law i recommend that people should have a firearm i think women particularly ought to have a firearm try and get past the the mood you get from your friends Ooh, i would never have something like that in my house you hear a lot of that. You know, it's, it's as if somebody is talking to you about keeping a, a nest of cockroaches. Ooh, I'd never have anything like that in my house. Um, you know, I think you should think about having a revolver in your house. Ooh, I'd never have anything like that in my house. And uh, there's a tremendous exaggeration of the dangers of having a firearm. Don't believe the statistics, don't believe the studies, don't believe the experts. Just use your own common sense. If, God forbid, the worst came to the worst, would you rather have a weapon or not? Now, admittedly, having a weapon means you should be responsible enough to, number one, know how to store it in a way that it is safely stored away from children but also accessible if at the worst possible situation you need it. Um, and also that you are a regular at your gun range or gun club and that you really become proficient at using it. But with those two provisos, uh, I have to tell you, I, I do recommend it. I really do. 
I, I don't know of many places in America where you can rest assured that you will never, ever have to worry about anything bad happening. Different parts of the world, you know, it's um, today to own a weapon in the United Kingdom, which, by the way, used to be very normal up until about 1960. I don't have the exact date, but it's, it's somewhere after the 50s. Everybody, I mean, people had weapons all the time. There were people hunted. People had all kinds of weapons. Um, after the war, people kept revolvers and pistols after World War II, but that's all gone today, and it's virtually impossible. In most of Europe, it's impossible. By the way, Mexico. Mexico has a huge number of illegal weapons, um, but for law-abiding citizens, it's almost impossible. I do believe, I might be corrected on this, but I do believe there is one legal gun shop in all of Mexico. Very different in the United States of America. But you can be assured that the forces of secular fundamentalism are doing everything they can in order to make it impossible for people to be independent in terms of self-protection, self-preservation by means of your own weapon. And, and as I say, particularly for women. I mean, gosh, there are so many bad things that happen. I, my goodness. If a woman, and, and there are plenty really usable um, weapons that a woman can carry in her pocketbook or her purse, uh, and everyone has to make their own decision, everyone has to figure it out for themselves, but I do encourage you not to buy into the cultural mood, which is weapons, firearms, ooh, what sort of person are you? The person who likes to be independent and who knows that you can take care of yourself if you have to, right? What sort of weapon do I recommend you want to know? <laughs> well, um, I, look, I, I'm going to answer that question. I, I do get asked it quite a lot. I am going to answer it uh, with the proviso that it's very much a matter of personal choice. But I will tell you what my personal choice is and what Mrs. Lappin's personal choice is. And uh, I'll give you the reasons for it. But in the final analysis, if all I'm doing is making one listener who has never considered the possibility of owning a firearm, rethink it and consider maybe it's a good idea. I'll be quite pleased about that, actually. So uh, I'll tell you, there's two basic separate classifications of handguns. One is what is called a semi-automatic pistol, and the other is called a revolver. And uh, they both use exactly the same kind of shell or bullet that I described earlier, but uh, they work differently. Now, please stay with me on this. And I know that a number of women are going to, oh, I can't believe he's going to talk about it. Who cares about this stuff? Uh, but think about it. Maybe you actually do. What would be so terrible about actually knowing a little bit more about firearms than you do? So a very brief lesson. I'm only going to devote a, a couple of minutes and then we'll uh, wrap up the show. Um, so you've got two basic kind of firearms. Uh, one of them, a semi-automatic pistol. What happens here is that there is a magazine in the grip of the gun, a magazine which holds typically 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 rounds, 7, 8, 9, 10 bullets or shells, and they're spring-loaded. And um, and then there is a slide um, over the barrel of the gun, which has to be operated. And you pull the slide back. And what that does is loads a it grabs a bullet from the uh, magazine, puts it puts it into the chamber and it's now ready for firing. When you pull the trigger and it fires, part of the recoil of the uh, bullet goes to pushing the slide back which means it grabs another bullet and puts it in position ready to fire. Um, a gun that keeps on firing bullets as long as your finger is on the trigger is called a machine gun. It is, it's been illegal for many years for private ownership. 
uh, the gun I'm talking about, a semi-automatic pistol, uh, fires one round with every separate pull of the trigger. The other kind of gun is called a revolver. This has a rotating cylinder in which you put five, six, or seven, most usually six rounds, six shells, and then you snap it back into the frame of the revolver. And now, if it's what's called a single-action revolver, you pull the hammer back with your thumb or with your other hand, and then you pull the trigger, the hammer drops onto the percussion cap at the back of the bullet, the, the gases go off and expand, and the bullet goes flying down the barrel. And what that also does is rotates the cylinder so the next bullet is in position for the next time you pull the trigger, the hammer will then fall on a fresh round. And um, Mrs. Lappin and I, we prefer revolvers to automatic pistols. And it's not just the history of it. Samuel Colt made the first revolver, I think it was about 1835, and uh, to this very day, one of the most beautiful and uh, magnificently designed and built revolvers in, in the ordinary sizes would be a Colt Python. Uh, I, I very much like that weapon. But you can also get a, an excellent weapon like the Smith & Wesson uh, 686, and there are many other manufacturers as well. Uh, we prefer revolvers to semi-automatics. And it's not just because it's historic. Uh, if you think about the Westerns, every time you saw John Wayne bring down a bad guy, he had in his hand a revolver. That was the, the gun of the West. It was the revolver. Uh, today, oh, by the way, also police forces used to use revolvers for quite a long time. But today, uh, the automatics have, the semi-automatic pistols have largely taken over. So if you've heard of people you know, speaking about a Glock, Glock doesn't make revolvers as far as I know. Glock makes semi-automatic pistols. And it's a polymer. Part of the, the gun is made of a polymer, sort of a plastic. Again, it's unusual, but it's certainly a very valid choice for a weapon. Uh, why do we prefer a revolver to an automatic pistol? Um, I'll give you a few reasons. One of them is that the shape of the grip of an or semi-automatic is largely governed by the magazine containing an eight, nine, or ten rounds of ammunition inside the grip. And the grip has to be big enough to contain that magazine. The shape of a revolver's grip is in no way uh, shaped by the need of having ammunition inside it, because there is no ammunition inside the grip of a revolver. You'll remember the ammunition is inside a rotating cylinder in the body, in the frame of the gun. And so um, the shape of a revolver grip uh, can be a much better fit, particularly for a woman's hand. And... Uh, and you, by the way, you, you can go into a gun shop and ask them, or a gun range for that matter, and uh, ask them to let you try revolvers and pistol. You'll see right away exactly what I mean. The, the, the distance front to back of a revolver grip can be much shorter than front to back of a semi-automatic. Um, and what's more, the, the, the grip of a, of a revolver can be curved in a, in a way that much better fits your hand. So... Um, when, when you've got a good, firm, comfortable grip, and if you have nice rubber grip covers, um, it, it, it's very good. It, it helps your accuracy. It's more comfortable to hold. Uh, it, it helps you manage the recoil better. So that's one reason we prefer a revolver to a semi-automatic. Although I won't take away the historical romance of the revolver and the role it played. and I, I, I won't say that's of no value, but that's not a good enough reason. Another reason is that um, when you buy a semi-automatic, you've got to buy it to a very specific bullet size, a specific caliber round. In a revolver, for instance, you can buy a 357 caliber Magnum revolver, 
and that takes a shell that is 0.357 inches in diameter and it takes it's it's a heavy you know it takes there's quite a lot of gunpowder in there it's uh, it's a pretty substantial round but you can also use 38 special rounds in that same revolver which is a much lighter round it's cheaper you can use it for target shooting you may decide you like using it anyway um uh, revolvers that uh, take 44 magnum will also take 44 specials unlike a semi-automatic which is one caliber and that's it another thing is that um, the sights you know if you want to target shoot the sights of a semi-automatic pistol the front sight is and the back sight is attached to the slide i mentioned earlier which uh, oscillates backwards and forwards it, it flies back when you fire and then flies forward again and then it's sort of loosely attached to the barrel in a way i, I can't describe it without a diagram uh, but the bottom line is this is really not ideal for accuracy whereas on a revolver the sights are adjustable they're fixed they're not on any moving parts and for for target shooting a revolver any day of the week Here's another thing. You never know if a semi-automatic pistol is loaded without examining it. You even have to pull the slide back to check there's nothing in the chamber. A revolver, you can actually see if it's loaded without even touching it because you can just see what's in the cylinder. Um, here's another one. If you've ever fired a semi-automatic, you know that it flings the spent brass casings all over the place. They come flying out of the ejection slot and um, it means you know whether you're using your left hand or your right hand you can get a face full of hot lead or if uh, if somebody's standing next to you and not paying attention they can get hot brass flying at them a revolver doesn't throw out spent casings they remain inside the cylinder until you press the ejector rod and then you get rid of them uh, here's another thing on a revolver you can use a type of shell called a shot shell and that is it's a cartridge which in the front doesn't have a solid lead bullet but it has a sort of a housing that holds maybe 10 or 20 tiny little lead balls now again you know you, you may decide yes or no but for some people uh, they find that valuable for a number of reasons first of all if you fire a shot in terms of self-defense there's no danger of the bullet going through a uh, a wall and into the next room shot shells won't do that number two even if you're not that accurate with a shot shell uh, it's uh, you know it's like what they use for birds or ducks you've got a sort of expanding pattern of shot which can be very discouraging for a bad guy to get a face full of bird shot you can't use that with a semi-automatic pistol but you can with a revolver and here's something else and with a revolver, you can use something called plastic shells that don't use gun powder. They just use percussion caps. They're a lot of fun. <clears throat> you can actually use them in your living room. It's not very loud. They don't send out much force. But you can actually use them for target practice right inside um, because it's not like firing a, uh, a, a metal bullet. And so all of these are things you cannot do with a, uh, a semi-automatic but you can do with a revolver anyway that's just uh, from the Lappin's perspective of weapons but at any rate uh, what I wanted to do at least was perhaps just a little bit change your opinion uh, change your opinion on um, firearms and their role uh, particularly as life somehow um, gets more dangerous today in many parts of the world so uh, that brings us as far as we're going to go today a little bit of an unusual type of um, of show i suppose but nonetheless one i hope that you enjoyed um, the uh, website rabbi daniel and uh, by the way i told you we got a new shipment of rabbi daniel Lappin recommended bibles in i've told you about them and um, there really there's no such thing as a household without a bible it doesn't make sense it really doesn't make sense. So um, if you'd like a one of these beautiful Old Testaments 
then go to my website at rabbidaniellappin.com, head over to the store, look for Rabbi Daniel Lappin's recommended Bible. It comes in two sizes. There's a compact size and there's a full size. I only use the full size. Uh, I just find it um, the right size for me. It just works, and I don't have to strain my eyes to look at any small print. Other people like the portability, but um, have a look at rabbidaniellappin.com. Look at the recommended Bible. Everybody needs one, seriously. I mean, it. it <laughs> how can you not have a Bible? So uh, be aware of it. It's right there, and at, at least go and look up the reasons why this is different from any other Bible you might ever own. So you'll find that at the website. And uh, I urge you, in the week ahead, please focus on your five Fs, onwards and upwards. You're not a tennis ball floating down the gutter of life. And you try and further your interests in your five Fs. Make it a week of growth in your family, in your finances, in your faith, in your friendships, and in your fitness. Make sure that where you are tomorrow in all of those five areas is further than you were yesterday. Growth. And it'll all work well. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Thanks for being part of the show. Till next week, God bless.